Genesis chapter 17. We're looking at verses 8 through 15. And if you have it, will you stand? And if you don't have it, will you stand in honor of God's word? If your neighbor has a Bible and you don't, ask your neighbor, will you share with me? Share your word with me. Exodus chapter 17, verses 8 through 15. Amen. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out. Fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him. So Joshua, pardon me, did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Ur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Ur stayed up his hands, the one on one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. You may be seated. Father God, I thank you for your peace. I thank you for your joy, your calm. I thank you for your strength. I thank you for being the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I thank you for being a keeper. Hallelujah. I thank you and I praise you for being able to come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain your mercy. Have your way in this place. Let nothing be said or done that is not pleasing unto you. Hide me behind the cross in the name of Jesus. I seek your anointing. For it is your anointing that destroys the yoke of bondage. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Hallelujah. So we have some significant individuals that are here in Exodus chapter 17, verses 8 through 15. I was reading it, um, read it earlier uh, throughout the year, and I uh, read it again this morning and had read um, some of the history of it a few uh, days ago as well in regards to just I'm trying to read the Bible throughout. So I go back and chew on something, look at it again, go back and chew on something else, look at it again. And... Um, Prior to them coming to this particular point, the children of Israel were actually going through some other situations because of their disobedience. So it's, fine, it's very interesting that as soon as they get into a situation where they're having a problem because they don't want to obey God, they have an enemy that they have to face. Okay, so if you look back in Exodus 17 verses 1 through 8, You'll see some of their behavior, some of the things that have taken place with them. They are in the wilderness, so that means they have left Egypt, and they have not made it to the promised land yet. But, and this is before uh, we're getting over to Exodus 20, when they get the commandments. So Aaron has been made a priest, and we have some other things like that. But let's look at some of the characters. Moses is one of the characters in this particular portion of scripture. Moses from the tribe of Levi. His main name means to draw, or he who draws out, savior, deliverer, or he was saved from the water. He was married to an Ethiopian woman, yeah. so Moses was interracially married. He has some mixed children. He's relatable. He was adopted. Moses was not raised by his parents. Moses was adopted by an Egyptian princess. He was a leader. He was an instructor. He had a direct connection with the Lord. This is the same Moses who saw God speaking to him from a burning bush. Remember that Moses, okay? This is the Moses who represents worship and fellowship and direct connection with the Lord. Because the people of God, the children of Israel, while they prayed to be delivered, they, 
they did not have a direct connection to God to speak to him and to listen to him because they were always complaining on one side and then wanting him to deliver them on the other. So Moses was that direct connection to God. Okay? And he was the earpiece and the mouthpiece for the Lord. Okay? Then we have Aaron. Aaron is Moses' older brother. He's also from the tribe of Levi. He's the first high priest that was dedicated after the exodus, out of coming out of Egypt. He's the first high priest. He's a husband and a father. Aaron was who, the mouthpiece for Moses. So God spoke to Moses, downloaded instructions on what to do and all the rest of that, and Moses spoke to Aaron, and Aaron spoke to the king. Remember that? Because back in the day, Moses was like, I'm too scared, I can't talk, I stutter a lot, I don't feel comfortable. And then the Lord said, well, Aaron will be your help. Aaron is going to go with you. And he's going to say what you tell him to say. And Aaron's going to do what you tell him to do. So Aaron's assignment was to assist Moses as God gave him instructions for a divine assignment for the people. He was the lead priest of the nation. Aaron bore witness of the triumphs and tragedies of the wilderness. Aaron bore witness of what it was like to serve as the first priest for the tribe of Levi. It was Aaron's two sons. Aaron had four boys and his other family members, but it was Aaron's household that was first anointed, that was first given the assignment of taking care of God's house. It was Aaron's assignment to lead the people into worship so that they could secure God's forgiveness. It was Aaron's assignment to make sure that the offerings were correct and appropriate. And all throughout the, the Old Testament, you'll see with Aaron on different times, he was doing good. He was leading people to God. And other times he was building golden calves and having them worship things that were not God. Aaron was learning. He was learning. Moses was learning. He was learning. Aaron. Aaron is the same high priest who son, had two sons of the four that died. And he was not permitted to mourn for them. This is that Aaron. Can you imagine? When God has given you an assignment as such, as a high priest, and his household was given that assignment, and his two sons did not understand the weight of the assignment. So what they did is um, there were times that there had to be a fire that would be brought in and they put on the ephod and they did different rituals and things of that nature and dedication and appreciation unto the Lord. And Aaron's two sons thought it would be cool to make the fire like blue uh -huh. or to make the fire pink like, oh, my favorite color is blue. What's your favorite color? My, my favorite color is pink. So they got some coloring and went into the tabernacle and threw the coloring into the fire. And immediately they fell dead. When Aaron found out about it, Moses was calling him and calling his other sons that he had remaining and calling his uncle to show up and give an account. Because it was Aaron's responsibility to make sure that these boys did what they were supposed to do. It's that Aaron. Aaron then was told to put a cover over his head. Everybody in the household, put a cover on your head, come out, see these boys, and you bet not cry. Mm, my Lord. That Aaron. Aaron saw triumph as well as victory. Uh -huh. That Aaron. But he still had to worship. Mm -hmm. mm. Er is of the tribe of Judah. He worked alongside with Aaron for the nation of Israel. You'll see that over, he did some judging with him. But we really don't get to see much about Er's family. You don't get to hear much about him. Some of them describe him as one of the architects of the tabernacle. So he knew what was going on with the worship service. He knew what needed to be built. He knew what different levels, where they needed to be and why they needed to be there. Uh -huh. And there he also, if he's coming out of the tribe of Judah, he's associated in the lineage with David. Right. Correct? He's associated in the Messian, Messianic lineage of Jesus. Right? So he has significance even though we don't hear about his background. Uh -huh. He's there for a reason. Then you have Joshua. He's from the tribe of Ephraim. Uh -huh. Joshua's from the tribe of Ephraim that the, from Joseph who got the double blessing because right. Joseph was a tribe but then it got split. And then you have Manasseh and Ephraim. He's from that tribe. Uh -huh. Okay? He's the second leader for the nation of Israel after the Exodus. Uh -huh. hmm. He led the nation to the promised land. He was a leader and he was a warrior. And the scripture says, if you rehearse it in Joshua's ear, why, why would he have to rehearse it in his ear? Let me not get ahead of myself. But he's going to tell his children. And his children is going to tell their children. And from generation to generation to know where you come from. Then you have the mighty men of war. 
You have these designated men that have been called out to actually go fight against the Amalekites. Uh -huh. And I dare say there were some strong women of prayer somewhere in there. Right. They may not have been mentioned, but if your man was going out to fight a war, wouldn't you pray? Right. If your man was going out to leave to take care of something, wouldn't you get down on your knees? I dare say there's at least one sister or two that will get together and would pray the unmentionables. We we'll call them the unmentionables. But there were some strong women of prayer. The Amalekites were the enemy to Israel. The Amalekites were, were there when the Israelites actually reached the wilderness, causing them problems, antagonizing them, not giving them safe passage, not allowing them to cross through from one side to the next. Just wanted to be their enemy. They wanted to defeat them. They wanted to hurt them. They wanted to steal their joy. They wanted to cause them to be afraid. They wanted to cause them to lose out on their inheritance, what was rightfully theirs. They wanted to, they weren't a part of the promised land, but they wanted to keep them from getting there. They knew they wasn't going to the land of Canaan, but if I'm not going, you're not going. They didn't want to go any higher, so they didn't want anybody else that was even in their vicinity to go any higher. Anybody know about any Amalekites? Anybody know about any Amalekites? They ain't doing nothing nowhere, but they don't want you to do nothing either. We know about some Amalekites. We know about Amalekites. And Amalekites were just bent on doing wrong. We're just bent on being silly. We're just bent on being haters. You know, just, just that type of personality. Just no, not happy at all. Just not happy. And so they're traveling through the wilderness being the nation of Israel and here they go. They got to keep on walking because they're not standing in the wilderness. They're traveling. Right. And they see the enemy afar off and like, oh, here we go again. I got to fight with the Amalekites. So then we go back to the scripture. And they fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses called Joshua and told him to choose some men. Choose some people to go and fight them. And I'll stand here. I'll be the leader. Mm -hmm. I'll stand here. So as long as you see me, you know you got the victory. Right. I'm going to lead you through. How are we going to make it out of our situation? We're going to make it out as a family. Yeah. We're going to make it out together. Because all of these, the nation of Israel is a family. What did we exhibit yesterday going on with uh, sending Mother Lane home and celebrating her life? We sent us, uh, we enjoyed family. Yeah. We came together as a family yeah. sending Mother Lane home, yeah. worshiping God, giving him praise, yeah. giving him glory, giving him honor, even though the Lane family was walking through a wilderness experience. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And we all could relate to one end or another walking through that wilderness experience, yeah. Yeah. which is why I have to stand next to you and actually work with you and hold your hand up or hold your hand as we walk together, walking through this wilderness experience. How are we going to make it out? How are we going to fight against this enemy? We're going to fight and we're going to defeat him together. That's right. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. So then it goes over. Let me slide a little paper around a little bit. So then we go over a little bit. And Moses tells the Jews people, I got the unmentionable women praying. And they go out and they begin to fight against the Amalekites. They begin to war against the Amalekites. They begin to stand against what they're afraid of. They begin to actually charge against that which is charging against them. Instead of running back from what is standing against them, they actually run towards it because it, God already told them that they had the victory. God already told them that they were going to win. So instead of running in defeat and hiding somewhere, instead of running back to Egypt or even murmuring, at that point, nobody said, I want to go back to Egypt. I don't want to fight. They said, oh, we can fight? Okay, we're going to fight because I got a little bit of this extra energy in me. I need to go ahead and let it go. So yeah, we're going to go ahead and fight. We get some mighty men and we're going to come down and we're going to fight against this enemy. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So they get down there, and they're fighting against the enemy. And the word says that Moses is standing with his right hand up, and he's standing with his left hand up. So both hands are up, and he's standing. And as he's standing up with both hands up, the children of Israel are victorious. They're winning. 
They're continuing to win. They're standing, him standing there as the leader. He's standing there as a representation, a direct connection with God. And then he's standing there with his hands lifted up as a level of worship. Because he does come from the tribe of Levi. And the tribe of Levi, again, is about worship. Moses comes from that same tribe. He comes from a tribe that knows how to worship God. He comes from a tribe that knows how to yield itself unto God, even though it looks like they are going to be taken over. He comes from a child, a tribe that knows how to war in the spirit. He comes from a tribe that knows how to go up and give their hands and release it to the Lord. That's what he represents. He said, go ahead and fight the enemy. Don't give up. And while we're fighting him, we're still going to worship God. While we're in this wilderness situation and we have not met the promise, we're still going to give God glory. We're still going to give God honor. We're still going to stand as if we have the victory. And guess what? As we're going into the battle, we do have the victory. Notice how I keep worshiping God and he keep giving me the victory. It didn't say I will stand here and all of my enemies would automatically be defeated. Hallelujah. It didn't say that. No, it didn't say that at all. If that were the case, if you just wanted to build up all the spiritual muscle, you may as well be a bodybuilder for sure. You may as well just go to the gym, get all buff and all tough and greased up so people can take pictures of you. Never to exercise your strength. Never to actually exercise it. You, what is that? I don't think it's attractive, probably, but you know, whatever. What is that? Why build up so much strength? Why build up so much hope? Why build up so, so much expectation for God to do something and not expect an enemy to come and try to oppress you from it? Not to expect an enemy not to try to keep you from it. You have to go on anyway in the strength that God has given you, standing even though you don't know that you're strong in your wilderness. How are we going to defeat the family, defeat the enemy as a family? Hallelujah. So Moses is standing there in worship. God, we are here. We're fighting this battle just like you told us to. I sent the men out just like you told us to. I went ahead and walked in faith just like you told us to. And we're actually winning this battle. The battle doesn't stop because I worship, but I'm able to be victorious through the battle because I worship. Hallelujah. Right? Right? My worship is going to take me through this valley. My worship is going to take me through this battle. Hallelujah. Then notice, Moses physically is not down in the battle, but those extensions, his family members, are down in the battle. So then his hands are up, and he's like, I've been going through this, Lord, for a couple of seasons. Jesus, we've been fighting all day long. Lord, I've been going through all year long. Lord, I've been, I didn't know it was going to take this long. I thought we was going to go in and be victorious, but I've been standing here for a few hours, a few days, a few years, a few months. Lord, I've been in this situation for quite some time, and I'm getting a little weary. And so my hands get to go down. I don't know if I can go on any further. I don't know if I have the strength. I've been up all night long. I don't know if I have the strength to worship you the way I know I can worship you because I've been going through a wilderness, because I've been going through a battle, because I've been going through different constraints that are coming down and weighing heavy on my arms, Lord, but I want to worship you. My heart says to worship you. My mind says to worship you. My spirit says to worship you. I worship you and get the victory, but it's getting a little heavy for me. Yeah. So his hand starts to go down. And as his hand starts to go down, his worship starts to go down. And the children of Israel started to be defeated in the battle. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. So as the children of Israel being defeated in the battle, because there's a, a direct connection, do you see it, to your worship? Yeah. Your worship is what's going to actually bring you through successful in the battle. Amen. So then what happens is, okay, worship again and then you get somebody else on the side of you. You get an Aaron to come and say let's still worship God. And Aaron comes on side of you and says lift your hands and we're still going to worship God. Lift your hands and we're still going to give God glory. Lift your hands and we're still going to defeat the enemy. And then here comes some praise stepping up with you on our side. Saying lift your hands and we're going to give God total praise. We're going to give God total glory. We're going to give God total honor. I know we haven't won the battle yet but we're going to praise him like we have. Let me stand alongside of you worship and with praise. Hallelujah. Do you not hear yourself total praise and worship center? Is it not related to you total praise and worship center? How are you going to defeat your enemy? Total praise and worship center. You're going to give God total praise. You're going to give him total worship. You're going to give him total honor. You're going to walk through your world in a situation with the victory, not expecting it just to be there when you show up, but walking through the wilderness, you know you have victory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, God. 
thank you, God. Hallelujah. So you got, you got the direct connection with the Lord, which represents you in your worship. Then you got that extension of you, all these different facets of you that's walking through the wilderness, still a part of you. Still a part of what you are going through. Everybody wanted to go to the promised land. Everybody. Everybody that exited Egypt wanted to go, right? So there was not one that should have been left behind, right? Right. So that means that we all have to go through and work through this thing together. How I can't walk past my brother and my sister and seeing them in a weary state and seeing them get weak and not give them an exhortation of worship and not give them an exhortation of praise. I can't tear down my brother or my sister. And that was what was so complicated about this family. The entire nation of Israel is a family. One daddy. They had one seed that came down and assembled that entire nation. But then you got Aaron, who was a direct connection to, to Moses, who knows how to worship God, talking about Moses' wife with Miriam, first priest of the nation of Israel. Knew how to speak correctly, but also knew how to tear down. Knew how to lift up, but knew how to talk crazy. Hallelujah. Well, we have to be sure about what we want to do. We have to be sure about our assignment with the Lord. We have to be sure about our role of what God is calling for us to do. Hallelujah. At that moment, this is Aaron the priest. Like I told you, his history, he's the one who created the calf. That Aaron. That Aaron who saw his sons die. That, that's the same Aaron. Hallelujah. This is the same Aaron that did not make it to the promised land. You know why? Because he was right there beside Moses when God gave Moses the commandment to strike the water, to strike the rock, to get the water. One time, Moses was upset because the people kept talking crazy. Family. My family. Yeah. Moses was upset because the people kept complaining. Family. Moses was upset because the people just didn't want to do what he asked them to do. Family. Moses was upset because they just couldn't get along, family. Miriam always had something to say. Miriam talked crazy about his wife, too. The Lord struck her with leprosy immediately. Immediately struck with leprosy. The leprosy type that Pastor Brian talked about a few weeks ago when your limbs fall off. That kind of leprosy. Not a cough. Not the flu. But literally fingers and legs going to fall off because she put her mouth on God's man's wife. Because she wasn't just your average sister. That the Bible describes her from Ethiopia. When you look at the history of what I looked at earlier, she was dark. Very dark. Chocolate dark. Which looked a lot different than the children of Israel. So they talked and they spoke against her. And Miriam was the one that was like the ringleader. And Aaron was like, I know, right? Why you marry her? And Miriam, because she started it, got leprosy. The camp could not leave because Moses, being God's instrument, knew that Miriam needed forgiveness. Now, she was the one who did the offense, but Moses chose not to hold offense in his heart. So he had to pray for her. He prayed and said, Lord, I forgive her, you forgive her. Lord, I love her, you love her. Lord, it's okay, it's all right. She didn't mean no harm, Lord. And God said, well, seven days, she, she needed whooping for seven days. Let's get this completely out of her. So she won't say nothing like that ever again. So seven days, Miriam had to stand outside the camp looking real ashy. <laughs> real ashy. And then after the seven days, she came back. She gave her offering. She presented herself before the priest, and she was able to come back into the camp. These are those same people that eventually get to go, that nation that eventually gets to go into the wilderness. But Aaron and Moses don't get to go because there was a, you were guilty by association, Aaron. Because you knew the word. You knew exactly what God said to do, but you stood there while Moses took the rod and smacked the rock twice to get water. And you didn't say nothing. You didn't offer up repentance for Moses. You didn't offer up repentance for the people. And you knew to do it. Why? Because there's history in the word that shows when the people were talking crazy and there was a serpent that came out and a plague was getting ready to hit, hit the people. Aaron is the one to put on the ephod, ran into the camp, waving a reminder to the Lord.
Lord. Wave and worship before the Lord. Say, Lord, you can't destroy this people. These are your people. They will worship you, God. And he knew the people had done wrong. But in that sense, Aaron didn't want to worship God. In that sense, Aaron didn't want to give God worship and reverence. He thought it was him. He wanted some of the glory. Hallelujah. These same individuals, it's family, y'all. We have to learn from the testimony of these individuals. Not just read about them. I gotta learn from, so I gotta learn when I'm receiving some type of offense, not to hold it in my heart, but to actually give up forgiveness, to give up prayer, to give up honor, and to give up worship. Hallelujah. To give God praise. And it may take you, it may take me with it, because you may stumble. Who was it that said, had it not been in the house of my friend, I could have withstood it? But the enemy knows that. That's why it comes to those that are closest to you. Those are the ones that can get to you. Those are the ones that can call you problems. But how are we going to make it, y'all? We're going to make it as a family. That means I can't leave the one that may have offended me behind. Because I want to make it too. And I want them to make it too, right? It means that I cannot pray for the one that I don't necessarily like. It means that I cannot encourage the one that I may necessarily not care for so much. we got to make it as a family. Hallelujah. Moses and Aaron are blood brothers. And they are all the brothers, but they definitely got the same mama. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Walking alongside one another in service. Feeding those when they are hungry. Giving shelter when you're without. Giving water when you are thirsty. Fighting alongside you. That's what families do. Fighting alongside you against the enemy. That's what families do. Praying with you. Tarrying, waiting with you. That's what families do. And when you get weary, one should come on one side and the other should come on the other side and hold your hands up. And notice in the middle of the battle, God gave Moses a little rest because they put a seat up under him. He got a little rest in the middle of that battle. In the middle of that wilderness situation, God gave Moses some rest in it. Hallelujah. And they were defeated. They defeated them. Joshua and the mighty men and the unmentionable women of prayer defeated and won the victory for that battle. But they did not defeat them totally. They weren't defeated totally. 100% wiped out. They were pushed off to the side. Could that be why God said, speak this into the ear of Joshua? Could you remember some things or be taught some history about your family so you can remember where you came from? So you can remember some of the triumphs of your family? Could that be the reason why we have these family reunions? Could that be the reason why we are to fail not to assemble ourselves together? Because we have to be reminded about God's goodness. We have to be reminded about God's faithfulness. We have to be reminded about who God is. Amen? Amen. Could that be the reason? Because the Amalekites were not defeated 100% wiped off the face of the planet there. No. Actually, let's see here. Moses fought against them with Joshua. Saul was told to kill them all. And he refused. Kept the king, kept some of the sheep and all the oxen and whatever the case may be that he wanted to kill. It was Samuel that actually killed the king, not Saul. So in the middle of him doing all that, some of the Amalekites actually escaped. So then you have David having to deal with this same devil. David, these are the Amalekites that came and pillaged their land and took their wives and their children. This is the same day David in that situation where he commanded the ephod and asked if he should go and pursue. And God told him to pursue and recover all. It's those Amalekites. That's why it had to be rehearsed from this generation to the next generation because it was going to come back up. You have to tell your children how you came out of a, a crazy situation. You have to tell your children how you were able to work your jobs and take care of your family. You have to tell generation upon generation upon generation the things that your family came through so that they'll have a point of reference. Amen? So they won't feel like, well, these were the Amalekites that killed off that side of the family. Or this was the situation that killed off the other side of the family. You have to tell about your victories and your struggles. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you. And so David goes and he fights the Amalekites in 1 Samuel 30. 
And finally, King Hezekiah in 1 Chronicles, he had 500 men that finally wiped them off of the earth. So God's promises are still yes and amen when he promised that they would be wiped off immediately from generation to generation. But it took several generations for it to get there. But notice how they started. They started fighting them with worship. They started fighting them with praise. They started fighting them by being obedient and giving God honor. How are we going to defeat the enemy? We're going to defeat the enemy with praise, glory, and honor to God. Then we'll be able to say, God is my banner. God is my covering. This is the side of victory over here. This is why I can say that God is awesome over here. Think about it. We have the basketball games going on. We have the Eastern Conference Finals going on. And each side is given a designated goal. You score in this goal, you win a point. Your team member, the, your opposing team scores in another goal, they get a point. But you want to score in your area. You want to score where your name is lit up. You want to score where God's banner is hid. It's actually displayed. And not where your enemy's banner is listed, right? Yeah. Same thing. Same thing way back then. Same thing way back then. God being Jehovah Nisi, being our banner, being our safe zone, being our covering. Hallelujah. Being our hope. Being our sustaining power. Being the God that continues to bless us. So when we want him to continue to bless us, we want to give him some praise, right? We want to give him some glory. We want to give him some honor. We want to give him some worship. So if you're looking for peace, You'll find it in your worship, and there you'll see the banner of Jehovah Nisi. If you're looking for joy, you'll find it in your praise, and there you will see the banner of Jehovah Nisi. The banner of Jehovah Nisi says that victory is on this side. If you want to get to the victory side, you're going to go through that victory with worship and with praise. Not with any type of doubt, not with any type of fear, not with any type of hatred, not with any type of unforgiveness or anything like that. The banner of victory comes with praise. The banner of victory comes with worship. If you're looking for a success, you'll find it in Jehovah Nisi. If you're looking for joy, you'll find it in Jehovah Nisi. If you're looking for hope, you will find it in Jehovah Nisi. If you're looking for a breakthrough, you'll find it in Jehovah Nisi. Hallelujah. And if you can't remember Jehovah Nisi, you can't remember Jesus. If you don't know what else to say, you can't say Jesus. You can't say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, you are worthy. Jesus, you are honorable. Lord, I know, Lord, I know you will never leave me nor forsake me. How are we going to win the battle? We're going to win it as a family. God bless you.